All right, we are gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining our session today on safe and effective cockroach controls in multifamily housing. Our speaker today is Susanna Crisco. Susanna is a project coordinator at Stop Pests in Housing, which is part of the Northeastern Integrated Pest Management Center at Cornell University, where Susanna studied. Stop Pests in Housing receives funding from HUD and is dedicated to improving pest control and affordable housing. In our session today, Susanna will delve into the complexities of cockroach infestations and provide insight into the latest techniques, tools, and strategies for effective management. Please submit any questions you have, and we'll do our best to get to these throughout the session. And Susanna, I will let you take it from here. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And thanks to the HAI group for having me and allowing me to get this really important information out to you guys. Um, like Mary said, I'm here at Cornell University in Ithaca, but I do receive funding from the Department of um, Housing and Urban Development's um, office of lead hazard control and healthy homes and that allows us at stop pests to provide free technical assistance and training to hud assisted housing so i encourage you guys to send me an email my email's on the screen right now or pop by our website and find out more about the program and if you're interested in in-person training we have some opportunities I'm going to show you my website. So if you uh, get a chance and you're looking for information on pest control and housing, we have stockpiled some really useful resources for um, multifamily housing and affordable housing on pest control. So we have from the top, we've got recorded webinars on specific topics. You can request training, or maybe you just want to look up a pest solution like, oh my gosh, we have ants. What can I do? Um, down on the bottom, you see all the different resources. We've got templates for um, an integrated pest management uh, policy. We've got lease language help. We have uh, contract help with contracts. And of course, the most popular section I would say is working with residents. So you can go ahead and, and check that out when you get a chance or if you're looking for something specific. And Today, we're going to cover what integrated pest management is, IPM, why it's the safest and most effective way to control cockroaches in multifamily housing, and how we can use IPM to fight cockroaches in multifamily housing. And then really important is how to oversee, because we're not actually doing the pest control, but how do we oversee a contractor or a pest control um, technicians, even if they're in-house, how can we ensure that our pest control program is going to be successful? Uh, the, all the information I share, I work at a university and part of our policy is we have to share research-based information. So everything that I'm gonna share with you today comes with, um, is backed by a lot of research. And I have to say sorry in advance because I have a lot of graphic photos. I, um, you know, by no means do the photos that those of us who work in this field take represent all of public housing or all of affordable housing. Um, these are, you know, some of these re really heavy infestations are rather rare. And uh, I think when you work in this field, you tend to take pictures of the worst, uh, the worst cases, but I don't want to give you the impression that every building I walk into has some of these conditions. So starting with what is IPM, it's not a way of doing things like using a certain product or using a certain um, treatment protocol. It's really a, a system of making decisions and using control tactics that solve the whole problem, not just going in, we're going to kill cockroaches with a spray. So every IPM program, every pest control program that uses IPM should have um, should follow these steps in this cycle that start with inspecting and monitoring or identifying the, the pest, knowing how to identify a pest, inspecting and monitoring. Um, for most buildings or developments, if you can get into every unit once a year, that's great. For buildings that have higher level infestations, maybe you want to think about going in a little more frequently um, for really um, problematic units that have had pest infestations in the past, you might think about putting them on a more frequent inspection schedule. Um, and we'll talk about how monitors can help with inspections as we go on. Okay, so we have inspect and monitor, we've identified the pest, and now we have to scale the response. This means 
basically there's no one size fits all approach to pest control. We look at the size of the population and we look at the conditions and then we figure out what the best response would be. So the response for seeing two cockroaches versus 2000 cockroaches is gonna be quite different. Then we use multiple tools. That doesn't mean um, we don't use chemicals. That means chemicals are one of the tools that we use, but using other tools, for example, like behavior change, cleaning up, you know, that could be a tool that we use as well. Uh, we'll talk about those other multiple tools as we go on. And then finally, evaluate success. This is where I see a lot of properties that I work with kind of fall off the IPM wagon. We're not looking at the records to say, okay, what's going wrong here? Why has Mr. Jones's apartment been treated um, 41 times? This is a true story. Over the summer, I was working with a property. I said, how many, had they thought, you know, the guy kept reintroducing the bugs. I said, how many times have you treated? They didn't know. They went back and looked at their records. 41 times that poor man lived in an apartment that was chemically treated 41 times, but no one went back to look at the records to say, hey, you know, something's going wrong here. If this problem hasn't been solved after 41 treatments, then maybe we're doing the wrong treatment. So going back, evaluating success and making sure we're spending the time and the resources in the places that need it most. Another way to look at IPM comes from the Pennsylvania IPM program. So IPM in practice is uh, like this pyramid. We start with uh, education and awareness, that's my job, and then pest proofing and sanitation. Then we move to physical controls, which could be heat or cold. Uh, then we talk about, we add mechanical controls, which could be mattress encasements when you're talking about bed bugs, um, exclusion, and uh, vacuum, which is a really valuable pest control tool. Uh, and then, of course, at the top of the pyramid is pesticides. We're still using pesticides. When I talk about IPM in the um, context of multifamily housing, I want to make sure that people get understand that it's really a team approach. We're not outsourcing to the exterminator or the pest management professional. We are um, looking at all the things that we can do in a building or a development that will contribute to the success of a pest control program. And that takes everybody. Everybody who works and lives in the building should be somewhat involved in pest control and, and making sure that pest control is successful. Um, so you can see all the different roles and roles that we have in a typical uh, property or typical um, housing organization. But what you might not have at your organization is an IPM coordinator. Um, often that is that's not just someone that you hire that does that one job, but that's somebody that's been designated that will pay be paying more attention to pest control. This could be your property manager, maybe the head of maintenance, somebody that's going to go back look at the pest control records, figure out if there's something going wrong, make sure that um, the pest control company is following the contract and kind of overall just overseeing the pest uh, control program. You'll notice that I don't say, well, I did, I did just say exterminator, but um, we try not to say exterminator anymore. We say pest management professional, and you'll see in my presentation, I sometimes abbreviate that as PMP. What we're trying to convey here is that we're not, the word exterminator kind of implies we're going to come in with spray, we're going to spray every surface, and we're going to kill every bug. That just is not realistic. There's pesticide resistance, so the chemicals don't work as well as they used to for, for our, you know, most of our pests. Um, so uh, we want to manage the situation. So pest management professional or pest control technician kind of implies that they're going to be looking at the situation and figuring out the root causes of the, the infestation and managing that, that issue. So when you deploy an IPM program, you're going to see uh, additional benefits, not just fewer pests, but you'll see cost savings because once we get some of these chronic infestations under control, we're going to be spending less money on those chronic infestations, but they're not going to be spreading to neighbors. A healthier building, we're going to talk about the health impacts of cockroaches, fewer complaints, which is going to save you time, and of course, fewer pests. So the real reason I am working um, is with HUD is because cockroaches are health hazards and uh, we don't want them in our living spaces. And 
you know, people have a tendency to just consider them a fact of life in housing. Uh, you know, especially in warmer climates, it's a lot more challenging to get rid of cockroaches, but they don't and should not be accepted as a normal fact of life in multifamily housing. So there's the cockroaches themselves, their shed skins and their frass, which is a fancy way of saying cockroach poop. They can cause or make asthma worse. They're one of the leading causes of asthma among children in urban areas. They can cause or aggravate allergies. The more I work with cockroaches, the more allergic I became. Now I can walk into a unit that I'm inspecting and immediately if I stuff up, I know, okay, there's cockroaches here. <laughs> um, so you develop, the more you're exposed to the allergens in cockroaches, the, the worse your allergies get. So you can imagine a child living in a situation with cockroaches from birth, they're gonna develop a pretty severe allergy if they um, are susceptible to allergies. And then of course they can contaminate food, dishes, and counters. This is gross, but if you think about where cockroaches mostly travel between your bathroom and your kitchen, they're tracking little bacteria on their feet as they go across our counters. Uh, there was even a study in North Carolina where they found cockroaches um, were at a, a pig farm. They were picking up antibiotic resistant bacteria and then infecting you know, areas on that farm, but even the possibility of a worker bringing them home with them. So this is a, um, a big concern with the bacteria that they could be carrying. And then of course, what's really um, near and dear to my heart is there's uh, the pesticide exposure. We wanna reduce unnecessary and unwanted pesticide exposure. And I'm gonna return to that <laughs> pesticide issue in a minute. Um, so gross photo, I'm sorry, this is cockroach frass. Um, what I want to make really clear is this, this is where the allergens are. So a good pest control program isn't just going to kill the cockroaches and leave them there. A good pest control program is going to remove the evidence, the dead roaches, the skin, and the frass. Now, your contractors hopefully should be removing the dead cockroaches and skins as they because you know that's part of their job hopefully but the frass does the poop does uh create an issue and um because you know i'm sure you're all familiar with the issues and trying to get residents to clean so this is something that as um you know, as you work with your population that you guys have to decide how a situation like this would be um, resolved. Is that the resident's responsibility to clean the frass or is it the management's responsibility to clean the frass? Um, in some places there's asthma intervention programs through your local health department and they actually can help residents if they have asthma clean, do some of the cleaning, but that's not universally, you know, everywhere. So this is an issue that has to be resolved individually, who is responsible for cleaning the frass. Um, it doesn't need to be bleached. It just needs simple uh, solutions, soapy water even, just to remove and, and kill the um, allergens. We definitely don't want to do this, right? <laughs> this looks like this guy got painted over in the middle of the can-can. Um, definitely want to remove those before we paint over them. And I know no one's doing this, but it was just I've seen too many memes of this to uh, not share it. <laughs> so getting back to the other risk is uh, pesticide exposure. Uh, what a lot of people don't understand about pesticide risk is that it's not just how toxic the product is, it's how much we're exposed to it. That is the total risk. So um, for example, these products that we can buy at the grocery store that seem pretty safe, they're right next to the, the Barbie display. Um, some of these are used in a way that they coat every surface, especially like the bug bombs. And that, it, even though these are less toxic products because they're available to me or you without a license at the hardware store, um, they are applied in a way that we're becoming more exposed. They expose people more than uh, the pests that are hiding in the cracks and crevices. So another diagram to kind of drive this point home. Um, we have the less risk of exposure comes in the way that we apply these products. So for example, a, a rodenticides made to kill rodents. Rodents are mammals. We are mammals. So these are some of the most toxic pesticides we have around, right? But there's very little risk because um, 
now with the new laws, uh, rodenticides for rodents have to be put in a locked box. And hopefully there's very little exposure, um, at least for people to those rodenticides if they're properly put in the locked box. Same concept with these gel baits that professionals use. Um, these are applied in little cracks and crevices. They're applied where the cockroaches are. So there's less risk of exposure for the people living in that home, as opposed to the total release foggers and aerosol sprays that just coat, you know, a, pe a nice pesticide film over all of our living surfaces. And if we think about where cockroaches are, do we want these chemicals sprayed in our kitchens? And the other thing about um, the DIY stuff, the, the sprays or foggers that you can get at the store, they actually spread and scatter. They act as repellents. So they're scattering the cockroaches, maybe even pushing them next door uh, through the walls um, and making it harder to treat. And then they also increase resistance, which is um, a concept that, um, well, it, it means that the pests are not dying as much from these products. And the more we use, the more they develop resistance. So this is not IPM. Uh, if you have a program where you are, um, you have a contractor coming once a month and he's spraying regardless of the presence of cockroaches, I want you to really rethink that contract, really rethink some of the things uh, about that. Um, think about <clears throat> how, um, how a cockroach just randomly walking across a kitchen, the chances of them walking across that line of spray Picking up enough of it to kill it, um, are, you know, it's it's it. Th this will kill visible cockroaches, that's for sure, if they pick up enough of it as they walk across it. But think about the cockroaches that are in the walls and behind the fridge. Even they're never going to come in contact with that line of spray. Just we're not controlling them with sprays. We're just kind of killing a few off the top. We're harvesting a few visible cockroaches. But the bigger population of the babies that never even come out of hiding. Um, you know, they're, they're still just perfectly fine and healthy. So we are at Identify. We wanna make sure that we are all aware of the signs of cockroaches. Um, wanna know, is it a cockroach? You definitely wanna make sure that you've got the pest uh, identified correctly. And um, it, in the Northeast, we have something called a wood roach that sometimes wanders in, but it's an outdoor pest. So, you know, making sure we know from a professional, do we, is this the type of cockroach I should be really worried about? And yeah, what kind? And where? We have to really look at where the issues are because that helps you uh, develop a treatment program. What is a cockroach? They're all um, some live with humans, some just live out in nature. Like I said, the wood roach in, in the Northeast just lives out in nature, eating decomposed stuff and really doesn't become a problem indoors. So the ones that, the ones we're concerned about are the ones that come indoors, but they all, the one common denominator is they all make a lot of babies, which we call nymphs, very fast, and they're all active at night. So those are the commonalities. The common cockroaches we see in housing are the American, the Oriental, the German, the Brown Banded. And now I would add another, the, the Turkestan cockroach. I have to add a picture of that guy. That's a one that's becoming more of an issue indoors in the last few years, especially in the Southwest. Uh, but the one of concern, the star of the show is always the German cockroach. This is the one that really is the notorious for infesting kitchens. The American and the Oriental cockroaches, I actually have seen some um, Oriental cockroach infestations, usually in basements and around wet areas. Um, often they, the American and the Oriental cockroaches are just coming in um, because of moisture differences. So they're either trying to get to a moist place or they're trying to um, you know, escape dryness from outside by coming in or um, maybe try to escape flooding outside by coming in. So they're more incidental in their invading, but um, they can be, uh, they can get up to some significant numbers. Um, but really the brown banded and the German um, probably are more of a concern. So we're just going to focus on the German cockroaches because that's the most common and the biggest problem. One cockroach, so that one cockroach that you didn't step on, 
<laughs> in January, back in January, had an egg case with 41 babies. Maybe half of those were female, half of those were male. Um, and then by May, we've got 1,600 cockroaches just from the progeny of that one cockroach in January. By June, and population definitely picks up in the summer months. That's why we want to get our cockroach um, populations under control in the colder months. Uh, by June, we have 18,400. So you can see that how the population just um, can explode really, really quickly and get out of hand. So often we don't actually see the cockroaches. So great, now we've, we, we know how to identify, you know, the different cockroaches, wonderful, but what if we don't see them? We have to look for the signs, like the frass on the poop on the door in the picture on the left. That's a prob that could be a brown banded cockroach infestation because they like to be high and dry. Um, under the shelf, cabinet shelf, that little gap between the back of the cabinet and the shelf provides the perfect little hiding place for cockroaches. Um, but these are often the signs that we see rather than the live cockroaches because the cockroaches are active at night and during the day they're staying hidden. Sometimes you have to look for these things. This is a wall clock that you can't see any frass around it, but if you, we took the clock off the wall and lo and behold, it's um, a nice spot for a cockroach hiding place and that's where they were hanging out. So hey, you have Susanna, to look for the signs. Yes. We had a question that came up uh, from the previous slide. Is it true you should not step on a cockroach? Ah, I usually, I usually mention that. Um, this is the reason why you shouldn't step on a cockroach. The female cockroaches take care of their, their um, babies. They carry around the egg case with them. The egg case is very sticky. If you step on a female cockroach with an egg case on it, that egg case could stick to your sneaker. So what I do is, yes, I definitely step on a cockroach if it's coming, coming by me, but I always check the bottom of my sneaker to make sure I'm not you know, carrying the egg case with me. So yes, that's where that comes from. That is pretty legitimate, but you know, whacking it maybe with a piece of newspaper or a fly swatter or something is better than doing nothing, right? But you don't have to do that if uh, you have a good pest control program in place and I have a better solution coming up using sticky monitors that will catch those ones. Okay, knowing where cockroaches live, you all know they live near water, they live near food, they live in the cracks and crevices, but they can be anywhere in a building, anywhere. They eat just about everything, crumbs, trash, cardboard, glue. That's why some people accidentally bring them home in uh, cardboard boxes from the stores. Um, they love eating that glue. Um, they just eat about just about an anything in this gunk at the bottom of the garbage that we all are disgusted by. This would be like a feast for a cockroach. Um, but this knowledge that they eat everything actually is going to help us with control. Cockroaches drink, actually. They need water to survive. They can survive a whole month without food, but they only survive a week without water. So it's really important when you do have a cockroach infestation that you look for the leaks, look for the water sources. And this is hard to see here, but above this sink, it is not caulked and the water was just draining down into the bottom cabinet. So you have to be a detective and look for these types of things. A moisture meter often helps. Um, we find that in really stubborns or infestations that sometimes there is a water leak happening in the, in the walls somewhere. So it's important to know this might be contributing to the survival of a cockroach population. Um, when we want to inspect and monitor, we don't want to just rely on the pest control company that is coming in and basically treating units um, to locate all the cockroaches. We want all of the staff to be on the lookout and aware of these places that you might find cockroaches because they're not always in the units. They could be in a trash chute. Um, and often the, the, the homes next to the trash chute are very often have higher levels of cockroaches because they're using the trash chutes to travel through buildings. But also the boiler room, the basement areas, the storage areas, these are all common places. We say use a flashlight because often where we're looking are these deep dark crevices where um, you can't see even during the daylight. Um, and that will help you kind of focus your attention and look for the, the frass. 
But um, ideally, you know, a pest control company is going to be doing this kind of inspection, but it really doesn't hurt to keep in mind that your maintenance folks, your, and anyone who works in the building can be keeping an eye out for cockroaches. Uh, we had a question that came up. Yeah. Um, someone asked, should cleaning, vacuuming, and treating, should that lessen the cases in their units? Yes. I mean, that's, yes. So cleaning, vacuuming, and treating. Yes. Those are all things that we're going to talk about. That is all part of the IPM program. Perfect. Perfect lead into it. But before we do treatments, we do have to monitor. And um, this picture I get so excited about because um, there's so much information that we can get here. I'll try to stay calm and remember all my points here. Um, all of these uh, monitors, these are sticky traps, were found in the same unit um, or were placed in the same unit, sorry. And the ones on the left were in the kitchen and bathroom and the ones on the right were in the living room and um, bedrooms, right? So this can tell us so much. First of all, if this apartment had already undergone treatment, this is going to tell us, oh, the treatment wasn't successful, right? So if we're not monitoring after treatment, we don't know if the treatment was successful. This also can tell us where the cockroaches are, which is pretty obvious. They're in the kitchen and the bathrooms. Um, there might be one little nymph on the middle, towards the middle, but um, wherever the cockroaches are found, that's why we should be monitoring the bedrooms and the living room too, that those are the places that have to be treated. So they can tell us where to treat. Going even further, if you look on the, let's look at the, the first one on the left, there's a bunch of adults and then in the corner, there's like little speckies, speckled ones that um, are, those are nymphs. Those are, those are the little, little guys. And that's telling us that wherever this was placed, the cockroaches are hiding somewhere to the left of that, right? So the, the second one over has a lot of little baby nymphs on it. That tells you, oh, we are very close to a good hiding spot. Those nymphs, those baby cockroaches don't travel more than a foot. And I'm going to explain how they eat. And it's very gross, but we'll get there. Um, <laughs> they don't go more than a foot away from their hiding spot. They don't venture out. Females venture out a few feet. Males venture out a few more feet. But generally, those babies and the nymphs are staying put. So if we don't treat those areas where those harborages are, where those hiding places are, we're not going to get those nymphs. We're not going to get, um, you know, we're not going to have the impact that we would have if we uh, don't treat them. Oh, so I have a poll, if you can all help out by uh, participating in this poll. Um, I am curious if your pest control technicians use monitors for specifically for cockroaches. So the yes, they do. No, they're not. Or I don't know. But your homework is you're going to find out. <laughs> so I'll give you a, a, a minute to uh, type your answer in. And the point is, when you go back to work, look in your pest control contract, look around and make sure that your uh, pest control company is using these monitors, because we won't know if the treatment's successful. We don't know where the cockroaches are. They just help us so much. And they kill a bunch of cockroaches. And I can also tell you, I have some under my desk right now, because we have a cockroach issue in our basement, American cockroaches. And... Um, I catch a lot of spiders. So if you have a resident who doesn't like spiders, this is a really good fix. Okay, shall we close it up and share the results? So it looks like we've got a pretty even split between yes, no, and there's a few people that are gonna go back to work and find out. All right, thank you. Moving on to scaling the response. Just really simply, those monitors are going to tell you whether you have a really big infestation, like the monitors that I showed on the left. That's a pretty heavy infestation when we see that many cockroaches on a monitor. Or they're going to tell you if you have um, one or two cockroaches, or well, you probably have more than one or two cockroaches. The monitors, I should say, are placed also strategically in places where the cockroaches are commonly found, bathrooms, under the sink, behind the toilet, between the fridge and the counter, those places that are, you know, off the beaten track, but the cockroaches really enjoy. 
Um, so we want to in inspect and monitor before we decide on the treatment. Your pest control technician wants to inspect and monitor before they decide on the treatment, but this also helps with some of the in-house things that we could be doing too for treatment. So scaling the response simply means using a lot of tools and pulling out the big guns if we have you know, a heavy infestation and then maybe using least amount of interventions if you have a low level, just an introduced starting to build cockroach infestation, maybe you're just gonna use baits and sanitation. But we're gonna to get to using tools right now. So the other uh, strategy in our cycle, in our IPM cycle is using multiple tools. That could include sanitation, and I'm gonna talk about these a little more, eliminating harborage, that's different than sanitation. Sanitation is cleaning up the food sources. Um, when I say eliminate harborage, I'm trying to eliminate all the clutter where they're hiding. So the boxes stacked up and uh, places that they're hiding, essentially. Exclusion, blocking their pathways. I'm going to talk, I'm going to show you some slides on some exclusion tactics. And the vacuum, I'm not gonna uh, show you any slides on vacuuming, but I really wanna stress that this is really important. If you don't have a pest control company that is using a vacuum and removing the dead cockroaches, when they come back, the next time they come back, how do they know that it's a new infestation or the infestation is solved? They don't. So what we're, what hopefully they're doing is removing the cockroaches and when they come back if they don't see any cockroaches dead cockroaches around then they know we've got this under control if they are still seeing cockroaches then you know we still have cockroach issue the vacuum can also uh, be used to suck up live cockroaches and you don't need a license for this so one of the interventions that a maintenance staff might do is you could purchase a HEPA vacuum just for pest control and have uh, maintenance staff manage this end of the the treatment if there's you know time permitting and then of course targeted chemical use by a licensed professionals only we really want to save the chemicals for the professional because the chemicals that somebody who doesn't have a license um, have access to are just not strong enough to manage an infestation. So sanitation, yes, means we want the residents to clean up. And we, I know that this is very challenging in many circumstances. I do want to mention there is um, some research out there that says baits still work even in low sanitation. So never deny treatment to a resident because they're, they're not you know, meeting their housekeeping standards. Of course we want them to, but the longer you let, if you deny treatment in an apartment like this, you're missing out on the opportunity to kill a lot of cockroaches. They still will eat the baits, even in a situation like this. Um, but of course, sanitation is really um, a great tool because less food, less water out for the cockroaches, the um, less cockroaches you'll have. Sanitation doesn't, oh yeah. We did just have one more uh, question come in just for you to kind of clarify. Um, the question was, I assume a vacuum would kill a roach. Um, you know, the pest control professionals tell me that um, that there's so much dust in a vacuum that once the bed bugs or cockroaches get in there, they become suffocated because of the dust. Um, it, all insects breathe through their exoskeleton, their skin. so if their pores are clogged, they can't breathe. So yes, that, that, that will kill them, but more likely when a professional is doing a treatment with a vacuum, they're gonna empty that vacuum and dispose of the cockroaches that are vacuumed up periodically. Um, so yeah, if this was like something you wanted to do with a maintenance staff, um, you wouldn't wanna just keep that, that vacuum in a closet um, and let the, you know, have the opportunity for whatever bug you sucked up to crawl right back out of it. You do have to um, take some precautions. Good question. So sanitation also means sanitation of the whole building. Um, this was one of the cleanest trash compactor rooms I've ever been in. And the guy just hosed it down. I don't know how frequently, but you can see the hose there. It just was immaculate and it did not smell like garbage, which was a miracle. But it did show me like this person is taking the time and care needed to, um, you know, limit population growth, at least in the in the trash compactor and the, the common areas. Um, the other thing I love about this photo, if you can notice this in the doorway, they have a 
a door sweep that seals off this room from the rest of the building. That's really important because this is a, a source of cockroach populations that we want to kind of confine. And I'll show you more about that during exclusion. Um, eliminate harborage means reducing the clutter. Uh, you know, again, this is really challenging. One of the tools I know that um, some uh, social workers or resident services people have been successful with are these clutter image rating scales. If you can show people pictures, it's a lot easier for them to understand, you know, what the level of um, clutter that you're trying to, to eliminate. So, and, and it also helps for staff who are doing housekeeping inspections to kind of rate a, uh, a home and flag it maybe for uh, intervention or for a housekeeping violation, but um, just a, a good tool if you're not aware of the clutter image rating scales. Uh, <laughs> staff to have to eliminate harborage and I'm laughing because this is actually what my office looks like after I did a whole bunch of shipping last week. <laughs> so this is my office um, right behind me. Uh, it, it is a mess right now and um, you know, shame on me because we do have a big American cockroach problem in the basement and uh, I shouldn't be providing this harborage and after this webinar, I will be cleaning up. <laughs> so exclusion also means, uh, is also another really important tool, really important tool, sealing those uh, cracks and crevices, loose moldings, holes where the cockroaches can fit um, eliminates harborage too. So this is that um, rubber like cove base molding and I'm pulling it away from the wall here. Uh, in this particular unit, this was in the living room or in the hallway between the kitchen and the living room. And the professional was only treating in the kitchen. And I walked around the apartment, I could see signs of cockroaches in other rooms. And then I pulled this back and I was like, hey, how about here? So you really have to know where the cockroaches are, treat where they are, but just if you have this loose molding in a, especially in a unit with cockroaches, consider, uh, resealing that or uh, redoing, somehow amending this situation. <laughs> Cockroaches really like to be squeezed into tight spaces um, about the size of a quarter and a dime stacked together is the perfect size for a cockroach. They really like both their belly and their backs to be touching a surface. That's why they're, you know, we're, they're really wedged in those hiding places. Um, so that's why exclusion is really important. So this picture I'm showing how important, like the, what a beautiful cock job they've done. First of all, they've eliminated the gap where the cockroaches could get behind that counter and into the cabinet void. So they've blocked off a whole bunch of harborage, but also that line of caulk on the right on the counter level that's preventing, uh, that's creating a nice, smooth, cleanable surface. If there's not caulk there and there's any little gaps where food can collect those tiny little crumbs, um, cockroaches only need like one crumb to feed like 20 cockroaches a day. So they don't, you know, you want to be able to clean those surfaces, but you can't if there's, you know, gaps in them. So that's another way to think about how important exclusion is. You're actually blocking, you know, food buildup. We had a question. Um, do roaches eat cock? No, I don't know of any cocks that are edible to cockroaches. The problems we're seeing is there's a lot more soy in a lot of products. So we're getting like, people are saying cockroaches ate through, um, you know, wires is a good example, um, rodents too, because they're putting um, soy in a lot of uh, plastics now. So that's edible to them. So not sure that, you know, the um, if there's any edible uh, cocks that are edible, but we always um, recommend using silicone cock because there's less uh, shrinkage, but use the best cock for the situation. Um, even spending a little more money on a high quality product uh, pays off in the long run. If there's shrinkage, too much shrinkage, then you're gonna create some of those spaces again. Okay, uh, door sweeps, of course, boiler and the trash room. And then um, this was actually a unit door that had a cockroach infestation and that door sweep is actually doing nothing. And I know some buildings, you can't have door sweeps because of fire restrictions, but if you can have door sweeps, this is a really common place where, where um, 
cockroaches and bed bugs can travel in and out of a unit from across the hall. We always check the unit across the hall um, as, long, as well as you know surrounding units, but there's a high uh, level of infestations that ends up going across the hall. This is probably the most important thing that you could all be doing when you uh, go back to work. Make sure, and in your own home too, um, make sure these cracks and crevices under the sink are sealed up because what you're seeing here right now is um, all those little specks are cockroach frass. Those cockroaches were in the wall void, probably going to the neighbors because the neighbor's sink looked exactly like this. But um, you need to seal those plumbing access points or you are inviting the cockroaches to go through the entire building through the wall voids. Um, so scutcheon plates, um, shoving copper, copper, um, Mesh in there is helpful. Brillo is not recommended. That kind of degrades after a while. It rusts and uh, yeah, use the right product for the for the job. And I have some more guidance on exclusion on the website and some web webinars too. So finally, we're getting to the chemical controls. We're at the top of that pyramid where we've we've in, we've employed multiple tools, and now we're letting, we now we hope our pest management professionals are applying baits. Um, they are the most effective control we have for cockroaches. Um, there's not a lot of new innovative stuff going on in the world of cockroaches because we do have the tools. We have really effective products that will work. Um, what we see is when they're not working, it's probably because not enough bait was applied. I've seen, I've, you know, shadowed a pest control technician who we were in an over 100 unit building and he had just one tube of bait for the entire building. In a heavy infestation, you need a half to a full tube in one unit. So something else to pay attention to. Are they just putting a little drop here, a little drop there? probably not enough if you have a heavy um, infestation. So the amount of bait has to correspond with the population size. Um, those bait stations that Mira you could buy at the store often have the same chemicals in them. They're very safe to use. Um, and uh, But for a professional, it's more effect efficient to use these um, syringes. Um, so that's what the bait looks like. There's the cockroach, adult cockroach eating it. An adult cockroach, when they're done eating that, they go back to their hiding place with all their buddies. Um, and they die. It takes them a couple days to die. They die. Um, and you know who's eating their poop and their dead bodies? Those nymphs that are hiding in those hiding places that never leave those hiding places. That's how they survive. They survive on eating the, the poop and the dead bodies of the older cockroaches. So that's gross, but it does help us control cockroaches because they say for every one cockroach we poison with bait, that one cockroach has killed about 30 cockroaches the nymphs back in the hiding place. So they take the bait to the to the aggregation, to the rest of the cockroaches. Um, same thing with ant uh, baits. If you're just using a spray and killing a few ants, you know, that makes no impact on the colony. But if you give them poison that they take back to the colony, you're killing the whole colony. So these baits are really the most effective way to go and less exposure, like I mentioned. All right, now I'm going to stretch your brains. Do you know, another poll, do you know if your pest control technician uses baits or sprays, baits and sprays, or depending on maybe depending on the situation, or I don't know, but I'm going to find out. I'll give you a minute to answer. We had another question come in just while everyone is answering. Sure. Um, someone had asked, what is rotating? Oh, I switched that completely. I skipped that completely. Yes. Yeah, so rotating products means um, we're fighting resistance. So the pest control companies should have a rotation plan. Ideally, they use a different bait with a different active ingredient each time they come or they switch them every three months because that... Um, lowers the chance of the cockroaches developing resistance or bait aversion. Bait aversion means they just stop eating the bait. They figured it out. <laughs> no, they didn't really figure it out. They have a genetic predisposition. Um, okay, so uh, 
does the pest control the baits eight percent sprays 11 percent both that's very common and i don't know but i'm going to find out 11 percent. so yes that often we see baits and sprays being used and depending on the situation um but it is important to ask your pest control technicians what circumstances do you use sprays and find out get a little information from them um in my opinion you don't need sprays at all but your pest control company is going to have different ways of doing things and they may want to employ some sprays maybe during a really heavy infestation to knock that population down um they could use a vacuum but very often they use the spray to knock the population down and then uh, we'll use baits. Normally we don't see them used together because the sprays can sometimes uh, make the baits ineffective, but um, trust your pest control company, but do ask them questions if they feel they're using sprays too much. Insect growth regulators are uh, fabulous, really low toxic uh, control. And if you ask your pest control company, are you using insect growth regulators? They will be very impressed with your knowledge. Um, so IGRs, insect growth regulators, prevent the cockroaches from developing into sexually reproductive adults. They kind of make these screwed up bodies and they never quite get to the growth and development that they would need to to reproduce. Um, the products, the IGRs come in sprays, they come in baits. Most of the time they're already in the bait that your um, contractor is using. The important thing to remember here is they take a long time to work. So residents might get frustrated because they can take up to a month to really to really see the impact of them and lower the population. So um, it's important, another thing to communicate with residents that this may be the case. It may take time for these products to work, but they're so safe because we don't have insect hormones. They only impact insect hormones, which the, the insects have, not us. And then there's insecticidal dusts. Oop picture do not we do not want residents to apply them they apply them wrong they put big piles this doesn't work the insect is never going to walk through a big pile of of uh, whatever that is um, but anyway the the insecticidal dust that work well for cockroaches are boric acid one of the oldest pesticides we have available no resistance in cockroaches to boric acid it's a stomach poison they groom themselves after they walk through it and they ingest it a uh, desiccant dust dries the cockroach out and they eventually die and then there's chemical dust all of these dusts should be applied according to the label by a professional and in voids and under carpets or maybe or in wall voids or cabinet voids they shouldn't be breathed in by humans and not in piles. A professional is going to apply with a duster, and they probably have more professional equipment than this, but this was just an example of how they, uh, like a home duster, where you could apply something like diatomaceous earth or something, um, and it coats, you know, a fine coating. Moving on, we want to prohibit the use of the over-counter sprays and foggers for all the reasons I mentioned, not part of an IPM program, not compatible with baits. If these get on a bait, the bait becomes inedible to the cockroach. Um, and then, of course, resistance. The cockroaches are developing resistance, have already developed resistance to all these common sprays. That means they all won't be killed. And we're wrapping it up with a few more slides. Evaluate success. Um, look at the pest control records. This is a graph I will just explain really briefly. We don't have to get too far into it. Um, a researcher uh, from the University of Minnesota looked at the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority, their records, their pest control records over 10 years. They found that 75% of their pest control technicians time, they have an in-house team, um, was spent in 14% of the units. This was revolutionary <laughs> because they said they, after that, they discovered if we could get rid of the pests in these small percentage of units, we would have all this time to do some of the preventative stuff like installing door sweeps, um, doing inspections. And that's exactly what they found when they devoted the time to actually eliminate, and it was, you know, time and effort to eliminate the pests in these chronic units, they could um, spread their time more evenly and take care of more preventative actions and save money in the long run. The other tool that pest control companies will give you to help evaluate your success is um, a service ticket. After they finish a treatment, they should be reporting what they've done. And this tells us a whole bunch of stuff. So whenever I work with a property, I ask for, you know, a couple service tickets. It tells me what units they serviced, what the issues were, what they treated with. But for your information, it tells you when they checked in, when they checked out, 
how many units they visited. And with a little bit of math, I found out, well, they're only spending about three minutes per unit. That to me is not enough time to really solve a problem. So be aware that they're giving you information and you can use this information to kind of track progress. And just to uh, summarize, who does what and all the little pieces, um, in-house, you could be doing the inspecting and monitoring if your pest control company doesn't. Um, we, of course, are doing sanitation and cleaning, very important. Exclusion could be done by maintenance, sealing the cracks and crevices, and of course, repairing leaks. What we hope the professionals are doing is monitoring and inspecting, using a vacuum, rotating the baits monthly. Again, that's to prevent the baits from being useless because of resistance. We feed the same chemical to any bug and they are going to develop the, a resistance to it. They're gonna genetically, um, they're gonna pass on those genetic traits like thicker skin or whatever is the, the trait that makes them survive the pesticide. They're gonna pass that on and each generation is gonna be more and more resistance, resistant. Um, so no routine spraying. Don't let anybody spray unless they have an absolute reason, meaning there are cockroaches present. Um, and then no pyrethroid sprays. That is just a common chemical that cockroaches are laughing at at this point. And then use based on monitor counts, baits, dust, and insect growth regulators. And really important to you guys, these treatments, depending on the level of infestation, should be scheduled about two weeks apart. Four weeks apart if it's a low level infestation, but two weeks apart is ideal until there are no signs of cockroaches on those monitors. And that's why the monitors are so important. Other thing I think everyone should be doing is reviewing your contract, know what you're paying the pest control company for and make sure that they're doing it. A lot of times what they says in the contract doesn't actually make it to the technician that is uh, doing the work. Um, do they look for look in your contract? Are they required to use sticky trap monitors? How often do they change or check them? Are they doing yearly or quarterly inspections for cockroaches? What tools are they using? Are they using baits, insect growth regulators? Are they using a vacuum? Really important. And are they visiting every two to four weeks until the problem is eliminated? Pest control, no matter what the pest, is never a one and done situation. It always requires multiple visits. Whew. Okay, I got through everything I wanted to say and we have uh, some time for questions. Thank you. So we did have a couple that uh, just came in at the end. Um, the first one was if we were to close off every single hole or crack so that they had no access to food and water, how long would it take for them to die and would they die? Huh. So if you have a situation where you've removed, it would be very difficult to remove all the food because, of course, they live on any kind of biological matter, but it would take, um, without food and water, it would take a month for to kill all the cockroaches, at least a month. But as they're dying, they eat each other. So that may not be a very good strategy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so another one was, how do cockroaches originate in your home? How does an infestation start? Oh, good question. Because um, a lot of times we blame residents when it's really not their fault. M most commonly, there's one introduction in a building and then they spread from there. How they get introduced is um, usually, I, I would say the most common way they're in introduced is when you're buying something from a warehouse or getting something shipped from a warehouse that has a cardboard box and they're hiding in the cardboard boxes. So, um, or a discount grocery store that sends you home with your stuff in, in a box. Um, the cardboard box is the most common way that they are, they're coming into a building. But once, there is, they're in a building, it is really easy for them to spread throughout a building. They exploit all those cracks and crevices and the, the wall voids and, you know, pipes. That's the German cockroach, right? So the German cockroach is always indoors. <clears throat> the American cockroach, the Oriental cockroaches, they're often coming in from outside through drain pipes, um, through no screens on windows, under the doors, and anywhere there's holes in a basement is common um, because that's where they the, the environment they like is cool, wet, and, and um, well, warm and wet. So they're going to go into the basements where they can find, you know, their their ideal temperature, but they are coming from outside. 
Um, a couple more that we had. Uh, can you expand on routine spraying? Yeah. So what we want to avoid is somebody coming in, your contractor coming in once a month and spraying, spraying units, whether they're are cockroaches there or not. So with IPM, we want to inspect and monitor and identify before we do any treatment. So any kind of spraying or treatment that happens without evidence of there being cockroaches is kind of a waste of money and also exposing people unnecessary to um, pesticides. So routine spraying is essentially spraying without evidence of cockroaches coming every month spray. Okay. Um, are the monitors sold over the counter? Yeah, so the monitors have no chemical in them. I buy them bulk. Um, you don't need a license to put a monitor out. Um, you can get them on Amazon. You can get them on, you know, DIY pest control sites. Um, often your pest control company has access to buying some of these products in bulk and they can get a good price for you if you work with your pest control company. Ideally, they're providing the, the monitors. So it's a good way to introduce this topic is, you know, can we, can you purchase these for us in bulk? Okay, um, still a couple more. If you have an infestation in a building with multiple units, is it best to treat all units at one time? Yes, but here, here's how we prioritize. Heaviest first. So the heaviest infestation should always be addressed first because that's often the infestation that the rest are resulting from. So if you, Focus on those, uh, what we call focus units, um, you'll be making more progress than kind of spreading out too thin across too many units. Okay. Um, would box and plastic bag deliveries from post office UPS be a way to get in? I don't think that there would be um, a risk that those, that, that the, well, standing up for the post office and the FedEx people, I don't think they're warehouses are generally infested. I think it's where the products are coming from. Um, it's very often for food service um, facilities, um, bulk food places to have um, cockroach infestations. So where food is. Um, but yes, if that delivery is being delivered by FedEx or yeah, yes, it is a possibility. But generally the population is coming from a food, uh, a food facility. Two more minutes. Um, how to guarantee a new resident not bringing them in? Oh, cockroaches aren't as bad of hitchhikers as bed bugs, but it certainly is an issue. Um, what we recommend is, I mean, well, there's two ways to go about it. You could inspect, you know, their belongings as they're moving in, but they move in on the weekend, and you know, we can't really have control over that. Um, or three months after they move in, conduct an inspection. So often if a, a pest is introduced in a move-in, it's not going to be visible to us, unfortunately, until about three months later. So you may as well schedule that inspection um, a little further out so you know, so you can see the evidence. Um, you can also use those sticky monitors because I guarantee if they brought cockroaches in, those cockroaches are going to go to the kitchen where the water and the food is. And if you're putting sticky traps out under the sink and a couple other, you know, out of the way places so no pets or kids can get to them, um, you're going to find those, those um, cockroaches. Okay, but we'll yeah, you, you can't deny tenancy, right, to uh, someone if they do have, even with bed bugs, I think it's uh, in this, most places you cannot even deny ten tenancy. You have to work with the person to um, eliminate the pests. We'll do just one more. Um, okay. If we don't routine spray, what is a good preventative to not get roaches? Oh, you're not going to want to hear this, but sanitation and exclusion. <laughs> um a lot of uh, the repellents, I mean, they're just, they can repel them only so far. So if you're looking for like, oh, lavender oil or something like that, that's not going to, that's not going to do much for you. Um, because as when I'm, when I'm talking, I'm thinking as a building, as a building as a whole, um, because one person is using a repellent and then those, the problem's just shifting to another space. And if even if me, I'm using a repellent in my uh, 
in, in my own home, I'm pushing the cockroaches to the wall voids. I'm pushing them to harder and harder to reach places. So there's not really a good, and, and the reason why we don't recommend the routine spraying as a preventative is because unnecessary pesticide exposure. Why should we expose people to pesticides when there are no uh, bugs present? And the other important thing to know is those sprays that the companies say are preventative, they're really only actively killing cockroaches for two weeks. So, you know, it's not really going to be a preventative, a long-term preventative um, Maybe if a cockroach got introduced in the next two weeks, it might kill it, but it's not cost effective, it's not um, healthy, and it's not effective to be doing routine sprays. Well, but, thank you so much for that webinar. We oh, really yeah. appreciate your expertise. I think this was really great uh, for everyone to sit through. Um, we will be including a recording of this with a follow-up email. We should get that out um, hopefully this afternoon. Um, okay. Thank you so much again. We appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thanks to everyone for uh, joining us. And have you can always day. reach out to me if you have questions. Thanks. Mm -hmm.